What's going on guys? Today I want to talk about side imaging, side scan, side view, doesn't matter what brand you have. Uh, technology has been around for a little while, but I feel like it's kind of been overshadowed recently by forward-facing sonar and stuff, and I still think that there's a fair amount of people who have the technology but don't completely understand it or don't utilize it to the best of its ability. I'll start with the basics of just how everything works, and I'll have all sorts of screenshots and things on the water. I even have props. Look look at what I've made. It's a, a cardboard cutout of the water column and things of that nature we'll talk about. And slant range and the distance and how far things really are from the boat, what they look like, shadows. I'm going to have just as much information here as I can to help you just understand exactly what you're seeing. And like I said, put more fish in the boat. So hopefully by the end of this, you're a little bit of a side imaging expert. You can go out on your home waters, test out kind of what I've been talking about, or go idle around and figure out what you can find, maybe some new things that you've overlooked in years past. All right, here's our PowerPoint for side imaging. That's just what we're gonna call it, just to keep it easy. Uh, but all of this is basically going to be on the ranch. That's what I have on my boat. But like I said, same thing. Doesn't matter if you have Garmin, Hummerberg, same type of technology, just going to be called different things. They all essentially do the same. So if you don't know what it is already, it's basically sonar that goes out to the side of the boat and it's also encapsulating what is beneath your boat. It kind of ties down scan and side scan together when it gives you the whole image. But basically it's very useful and efficient to scan large areas uh, looking for bait, structure, rock changes, cover, you know, such as brush piles, things of that nature. It's just an efficient way to uh, basically see a large area in the water. So it's very similar to your down imaging beam. It's not a cone like 2D sonar. It's just a thin beam that is sent out to the right and left of the transducer. And the beam is scanning from the transducer all the way to the bottom. So that means it's from the surface, basically, you know, your transducer is just a little bit in the water in the first foot or so. It's from that point down. So this means you're capturing what's in the water column and on the bottom. And that's what some of these props are gonna kind of come up for to help you understand that a little bit because you're going to have a 3D area but it's going to be displayed on a 2D image. So being able to interpret what you're seeing uh, kind of becomes a little bit of a craft, I guess. At first, you may be a little bit more confused, and as you start to kind of put the pieces of the puzzle together and use it more, you see more things, and your mind kind of starts to figure out, okay, this is how it's just displayed. So once you kind of get over that hump and you figure out exactly what you're seeing, it, it kind of becomes a little bit more intuitive, and uh, it's just ties everything together. Let's look at a screenshot quickly just to go over the absolute basics of what side imaging is. So this black area here is the water column. So that is basically underneath your boat. Kind of think of it as down imaging almost, but we'll get into that this can also encapsulate looking off to the side, whatever that distance is, but we'll go over that more in a little bit. So I don't want to confuse you on that. And then to the left and the right, you have the actual bottom of the lake. So that's here. Here, pretty self-explanatory, looking to the left, looking to the right. Now these numbers down here, this is the range. This is the distance that you were looking left and right. So in this instance here, you are looking 60 feet to the left and 60 feet to the right. Now that is slant range, and we will talk about that in a minute, but just think of it right now in the most simple terms that you're looking 60 feet to the left and to the right of your boat. And the screen is going to be scrolling down. So anything at the top here is going to be the newest data. Anything at the bottom is going to be the oldest data. And the center line right here, I should also add, that is the transducer. That is where the image is originating from. So that is your boat position. That's the easiest way to think about it and everything is looking out to the left, to the right, and you're also looking down. So as you can see, you are seeing a lot of data at once and it actually can be kind of hard sometimes as you're out on the water to kind of take all this in. You'll end up missing stuff if you ever like take a screen recording or take a little video or something as you're idling across stuff and then review it later. You will definitely find things that you missed when you were out on the water. So now we'll talk about shadows and they basically allow you to determine the location in the water column of objects or fish. Now this particular image up here in the top right, these were gar actually around my boat and I snapped this picture because I thought it would be a good representation of this. So these are kind of long streaks here you can see and these fish, even though they are in the water column, the black area here that is depicted in the image, they are actually at the surface. How do you know they're at the surface other than I saw them at the surface? If you look at the streaks here and see how it kind of correlates with these shadows, this kind of goes with that, this goes with that, so on and so forth. And there's this large distance in between here. That lets you know that these fish are high in the water column. I'll show a brush pile here in a minute and you'll see what I'm talking about, but you'll have an object that's on the bottom and the shadow will be like connected to it. But since there's this distance in here, that's just letting you know that it's raised up in the water column. So that's always something you need to keep an eye on to help you 
basically figure out okay, are these fish suspended? Are they near the bottom or what? And then in certain situations, they can aid in spotting fish. So you can look at like a ledge for an example, or this little example down here are some bluegill beds. Let's take this back of a cove here and you can see, okay, it looks like dimples on a golf ball, right? So this is bluegill bedding. This is kind of how they make their, their nests, their area. So you can see like these depressions here where it's darker. And then you see these little spots in there just these little bright little blips in those darker areas, those are the actual bluegill themselves in the bed. So that's just an example of how the shadow is cast and then like the fish stands out on it. You can get the same scenario on like a ledge, uh, the sharp drop off, sometimes the fish is sitting in the right spot, it will cast a shadow from the actual ledge, but then you can end up seeing the fish right above that as long as it's not beneath the ledge. And then here is a brush pile shadow. So you can see the actual object right here. It doesn't look like much, but then you can see the shadow that is cast off of it for being a little bit vertical. It has a little bit of height to it, so you get this type of shadow with it. All right, so we'll use my handy homemade cardboard cutout here to help you understand the display on the graph, how it's being shown to you, and what it actually looks like. And we'll go over some other things like your range, you know, how accurate are these numbers, and just some other nuances and, and things of side imaging. So we'll start with the orientation of this quickly. And that is going to be the top of the cardboard here is going to be the top of your unit. That's the newest data. So everything is scrolling down. Everything on the bottom here, this is the oldest data. And then you have your range lines down here. So we'll start just in the most simple way that this is how it looks on your graph, right? This is your black area here. Shaded area is the water column. And then this is the left side of the boat. This is the right side of the boat. We're just going to say we're in a nice flat area. Uh, not nothing really going on the bottom here. So I've got everything drawn out here to scale that we are in 20 feet of water and we're looking out 75 feet both ways. So we are encompassing basically a 150 foot wide swath. So as a visual, this is how things actually look when you kind of push it together and you have your water column that is vertical. So you're looking off to the right side of the boat here. This would be the left side of the boat. And then this brings up a few good points. First thing I want to just talk about is this being your water column. Remember, we're not seeing just the bottom over here. We are seeing from your transducer level at the top of the water column, you know, basically let's just say it's straight over and then down, you know, this way. So you're seeing this entire water column. You're seeing everything in here. You're not seeing, you know, just the bottom. So that's kind of where the shadows and stuff can come into play and help you, you know, differentiate if these fish are suspended, if they're midway in the water column, things like that. The next thing to talk about is this center line here. So this is your transducer, remember. So if you were to run over something, let's just say we're idling along and we run over this flashlight and it's positioned like this. Well, how's that going to show up on your side imaging if you run directly over it? Let's just pretend uh, where my hand is is covering it up so it's going to show this part of the flashlight over here and it's going to take this part and it's going to display it over here and if you were to take this and fold it back together it would give you the entire piece one side of the flashlight here one side of the flashlight here so what that's letting you know is if you run over something directly is basically splitting that in half or however you run it over it's going to take part of it put it on one side of the screen and put the other part on the other side of the screen just because that's how side imaging is being displayed. Looking at your water column, if you picked a point here and you picked a point here where the water column meets the bottom, those are the same spot when you push this together. Now, the next thing I wanna talk about is your range lines, your slant range. Basically, these numbers here are dictating how far an object is either to the right or to the left of your boat. So I want you to look at this carefully. I've got 20, 30, 40, 50 by 10 feet all the way out. Notice how it is flat and you can see your distance and this is all drawn to scale to make this work. But as I fold this up, so here's 20 feet right now, here's 30 feet. If I take this and fold this up because we're in 20 feet of water, what did that do? That essentially took this side and this side, your range lines, and it brought them closer. So just kind of show it again. We're stretched out like this, but if I fold that up, well, that just brought everything in. So that leads to the next question. How accurate are these? Well, kind of comes down to how far away it is from your boat and how deep of water you're in. And I'll kind of explain that to you right now. So these numbers, themselves are not actually a true horizontal distance. This, uh, let's just say 50 feet. 50 feet is not actually 50 feet to the left of your boat. 
what it's referring to at 50 is 50 feet in slant range. So if you can imagine this is kind of the top of a triangle where the water column makes the vertical aspect and then your ruler here, which is 50 feet, makes your hypotenuse. Your actual distance is in between here. You would have to do the Pythagorean theorem in order to figure that out. So if you run the numbers, you do the math, you will find out that the deeper the water, the closer an object actually is. So let's just say you're in 20 feet of water and you see a brush pile uh, 50 feet off to the left side of your boat. It uses jig as a brush pile. That's not actually 50 feet off to the left side of your boat. It's actually gonna be a little bit closer. It's gonna be around, looking at my math here, about 45 feet away from the boat. So not a huge difference, but it is a difference nonetheless. Now, if you go to some deeper water, well, then that distance is gonna grow and it can actually grow to a pretty significant amount where you're off by quite a bit. But now let's say there's an object 70 feet away from your boat and you see it and you're in 20 feet of water. Well, now it's 67 feet away. So this number is actually relatively close. And the reason that's like that is because if you look at your 70 feet or the further out you get and you realize that this is going to have less of an angle to it, it's gonna be closer to being straight out like this, which is gonna be your true horizontal distance away from you. But if you get to these, you know, lines or these range lines that are a lot closer to you when you're in this deeper water well now look how steep this is so this distance you know the steep distance is going to be more than your actual horizontal distance so just for an example again if you're in 20 feet of water and let's just say 30 feet away at this range line the object is actually 22 feet away if it's uh you know right here say 25 feet away well now it's actually 15 feet away from your boat so just keep that in mind and kind of the easiest way to remember it is the deeper the water you're in, so the, the higher this water column is basically, the taller this is, the closer objects are actually gonna be to your boat. And the shallower you are, the more spot on these numbers are gonna be. So the next thing I wanna talk about is your water column and shadows and just where things can fall on this. Sometimes people see this and like I said earlier, this is beneath your boat like this, but just because something shows up in this black area right here, the water column, does not mean it is directly underneath your boat. What I mean by that is something can be in the water column but off to the side, but less than the distance that the water column is away from your boat, and it's going to show up that it's here, but it can be, you know, off to the side. So, for an example, we're in 20 feet of water again. Let's just use this little socket here as our fish. So let's say our fish is just suspended in the water column right about here. And it's not really far out here to where it's gonna show up, you know, out here in this area. We're gonna say that we are about, you know, 15 feet away from the boat. So that's going to show up about like here on your graph. But the shadow of it is gonna show up somewhere over here based on just where it's suspended in the water column. So that's very important to understand that just because it's in this black water column area does not mean it is directly underneath your boat. There are circumstances where they are just off to the side. And that becomes more prominent when you are in deeper water, say 30, 40 feet. And I have some screenshots of that. You'll see crappie and stuff and docks that are showing up in this black area here, but they are not underneath the boat. Another thing that I wanna to add to help maybe understand this, where things are placed and how they can show up in the water column but not be beneath your boat is by this right here. If you can think of everything being displayed in an arc, that will actually help you a little bit more. Let's take this little ruler here for an example. And the height here that's below my finger is equal to the height of the water column. So now we know this is the height of the water column here. And where I'm pinching this together is the transducer. Now, if we take this and we pivot this like this and draw an arc with it. So if you are driving past something, say a floating dock, so my finger here, you're driving over this, that's gonna show up on your water column. And you can take this and you can pivot it this way, okay? Now something that shows up down here on the bottom or in the water column, uh, but off to the side a little bit of your boat, as long as it's in this distance here, it's showing up in the water column. And we can do the same thing. I'll we'll just take it here, pinch it, pivot it. Now we're driving anything on the right side of the boat. If it is within this range right here, so the floating dock, something on the surface, you drive past it like this, that portion of it is going to show up in the black part, the water column on your graph, even though you know that is not underneath your boat. And I like floating docks a lot because they're kind of just like a good visualization of kind of what's happening and, and help tie this together of, 
of the water column not being just strictly what's underneath your boat. So hopefully that doesn't confuse you too much. When we get to some on the water stuff, it'll all tie this together. And the last thing I wanna illustrate with this is basically shadows. So I will turn off my other lamp here kinda so it does not interfere. But remember, this is the transducer up here and just you've got a beam that's that's shining out over this and it's it's blocking it so it's going to be casting a shadow. So we'll use this old flashlight here. It's gonna be a little bit exaggerated, a little bit bright, but you'll kind of get the idea. So here is a tree. I'll just say it's standing up and you've got this flashlight shining and hopefully the light's not too overpowering. You can see the shadow that it is casting off to the side. That's what you're seeing on side imaging. That is the easiest thing to see a lot of times instead of the actual object itself. That is especially true with brush piles or things that are not quite as hard. All right, guys, we're gonna talk about side imaging today. So this is a Lowrance. If you have a Humbird, you have a Garmin, it's all essentially the same thing. They're just gonna have different names for it and things of that nature. So we'll start off with just the absolute most basics. Looking at the screen again, just to refresh it, we've got the right side of the boat here. This is the bottom, this uh, orangish area. And then this is the left side, bottom. And then this is the water column here. So in the middle of the screen, this is going to basically be your boat. That's your transducer. So this is water column on the left side of the boat, water column on the right side of the boat. But really, remember we took the piece of paper and we folded it up, make this water column, this black area vertical, then that is actually really basically what's underneath your boat. So as we're sitting here, we just have some easy things. You have your range, you can adjust how far this is looking. I just use my plus or minus key. So this is 60 feet right, 60 feet left, vice versa. You can go 80 feet, set that to wherever you want. General rule of thumb. Set that at about three times the depth that you are scanning. So if we're in 15 feet of water, about 45, 50 feet. But I generally keep it at about 60. That seems to be a relatively sweet spot. It gets your ratio of everything on the size. Keeps it pretty nice and neat and uniform. So that's generally what I end up running. You have your source here on the Lowrance. I have a little bit older Lowrance. This is a uh, Carbon 12. So I have a 3D structure scan transducer. So I cannot change the frequency. But if you have a newer one, if you have a Garmin, you have a Humberd, you can change your frequencies on your source. So you can either use your 455, 800, or you can use your megahertz range. Just a refresher on sonar, the lower the frequency, the more power it's going to have. So if you want to see like structure, you want to see things, you want things to really pop out and, and use it in a little bit deeper water, 455 is your bet. Then the higher up you go, the less power it's going to have, the more detail you're going to have. So if you have a unit that just has 800 kilohertz, 800 is going to give you the best overall picture, the best clarity on things. If you have your megahertz units, uh, that's going to be the best in that case there. So if you have your megahertz, use it. It's going to be great detail. If you don't have it, you can run 800. Uh, but if you are looking like for just structure and stuff, 455 works phenomenal still. So don't discount that. As I'm sitting here, the screen is just scrolling. So this is the newest data here. This is the oldest data. As you can tell, I'm actually like the wind's barely blowing. I mean, moving me a little bit, but you can see there's an old um, concrete block here from a dock and another piece of concrete or something from a dock as well. You can tell they're close to the bottom. Here's the object. Here's the shadow. Same thing with this. So that's just a little thing while I'm sitting here. Also, while you're sitting, everything is going to be stretched out. As you're driving, that's going to give everything the most clarity. So usually you want to be idling about three miles an hour is going to be your best performance. On Humminbird, I know you can change your scroll speed. I don't know about Garmin, Lowrance, at least on this one, you cannot. So this just kind of goes to the speed that you're going to. But if you are using a Humminbird, you can actually manipulate your image a little bit. If you want to stretch things out and make it easier to see, like such as fish, you can actually set your scroll speed a little bit higher and it'll actually elongate things a little bit. All right, then we have our contrast over here. So this is just sensitivity on the ants. As you can see, I turn it up. Boy, that gets bright. Turn it down, dingy, hard to see stuff. So there's a sweet spot in here. I normally do not run it on auto, but you can. You can run it on auto. The unit is going to set it in what it thinks is the optimal setting, but you can also on the ranch, you can have auto minus or auto plus. So if you see if I auto plus, it's going to take auto and it's going to add sensitivity to it. If you do auto minus, it's going to take your auto and it's going to decrease sensitivity to that to get it to what it thinks is the optimal picture. I don't like that. I like to adjust it on the fly. I have to kind of just vary it depending on the depth of mat. It also depends on the structure of your lake. You can tell here where at Lake the Ozarks, we have a lot of rock. So if you're looking for brush possibly, or you're looking for fish in those areas, which can be hard to find on a really hard bottom, uh, you want to usually dial this down a little bit or it's going to actually wash out things. If you're looking for fish suspended in the water column, no big deal. You can dial that up a little bit more and they'll pop out a little bit. So here's the next thing to get into, which is your color palette. This is totally user preference. 
depends what fits your eyes, what you like. You can tell though, my sensitivity stays the same right when I'm doing this. And you can tell that some of these, see how bright that is? But if we go to like this one, that seems all right. But you go back to that one, you're like, boy, that's washed out. We gotta turn that sensitivity down. So that is something that you need to keep in mind. If you're going to use a specific color palette, whatever you're gonna use, you are going to have to adjust the sensitivity to that particular palette. I like to run like palette 10 usually, but again, whatever you wanna use, is totally fine that's just a user preference but just know you're gonna to have to adjust that now there are certain palettes like that uh bright one here is number eight if you're looking for fish like in the water column this is a fantastic palette to use you don't have to blow everything out and you can still see your fish they just show up real easy and then here you have just like your surface clarity so if you turn that on high you can see how there's nothing in there now but if i turn this off like you're going to get a little bit of uh interference a little bit of noise basically it, and that also depends slightly on your installation. You do have your motor and stuff back there. So usually if you trim your motor up a little bit, if you're getting a little bit of like uh, feedback through here, it's usually because your sonar beam is going like between your jack plate and stuff. And it sometimes can, the signal can bounce around in there a little bit. So uh, it does depend what side your installation's on, your transducer. If you do get that, you can turn your surface clarity up a little bit to clear that up. I normally run mine on like medium or low. Once you get moving, it's not too bad. You can also flip left and right on the Lorance if you want to inverse this, because you can actually uh, install your transducer backwards if you want. I don't know why you would want to do that, but uh, that's an option they give you. And then in more options here, you just have stop sonar. You can turn your range lines on, which we'll talk about the range here in just a second. I don't like that, it clutters up the screen. And then you can also do your view. You can do left side, right side only. One thing I wanna talk about is, this is a good object while it's scrolling past. See the size of this here. Looks like actually maybe a little bit of shad. Um, just note the size, okay? Now I go to left side, boom. Look how much bigger that is, okay? That's why the, you see people running um, two graphs at the console is because they want this they want as big a screen as possible everything is just so much easier to see on side imaging because you got to think you're looking at a very large area here on a relatively small screen but uh you don't have to have you know two graphs you can totally get done with one but if like you know you're scanning down a bank and you're only focused on what's on the bank or you're looking for a brush or something you know and it's on your left side turn that thing on left you're gonna see so much better all right so now let's talk about the range real quick i'm gonna make this quick because if it scrolls past this i'm gonna lose it so here's your range all right so we're looking 80 feet out to the side now this is looking much further than that but it's only displaying a certain amount whatever you want to set so as you increase this range say we go to 200 feet it's going to take this space here and it's actually going to compress it so i'll show you i'll zoom out see how it's still there you can still see everything but it's it's closer right but as you zoom in, the more you zoom in, the more this gets stretched out. So that's how side imaging is working. It's seeing far. It doesn't know the end. It just goes until it hits something and it comes back. And the job of the unit is just to display that however you have your parameters set up. So keep that in mind. If you have this range here at 80 feet, even 100 feet, and you're looking for like fish, it's gonna be very, very hard to see them. So turn this range down and that's gonna help you out to see more. Let's go graph around a few things and I'll show you uh, kind of what things look like and uh, it'll help you understand side imaging a little bit more. So we're just gonna go down this little bank here where we were at, nothing to it. There are a few concrete blocks and stuff out here that used to hold a dock up. There's a little bit of a brush pile near that. Now my disclaimer with brush is uh, sometimes it doesn't show up very well. You have to have a pretty solid piece of brush sometimes to get it to show up and to see its shadow. Shadows tell you a lot here on side imaging. That's one of the biggest things you can look for and uh, help you understand what you're seeing. And sometimes they just don't give you that good of a shadow. So you can see we've got some shad out here. You have an object that is uh, basically from an old sunken dock, I believe, that is showing that. You've got some fish that are suspended here in the water column. And it looks like you might have some fish on the bottom over here as well. But I think I need to turn down sensitivity a little bit to see them a little bit better. Sometimes like this, it's hard to tell if it's a patch of rocks, if there's fish. I'm sure there are fish scattered in there. There could also be just a busted up rock in there. So as we're driving along, I'll turn this up a little bit just so you guys can see a little better. You can see we drove over top of something right there. I would bet that has to be a brush pile of some sort. It almost looks cylindrical though. And then uh, you can see you have your harder bottom here, okay? So this bright indicates a harder bottom. And this right here 
indicates a softer bottom. This is just a softer area or deeper. You can actually see out here is actually part of the channel swing itself that comes up to the bank. It's relatively close to the bank. That's basically right underneath my boat is, is where this is. It's, it says it's 40 feet away, but it's actually not that far away at all. You see we've got some crappie suspended right there. And then this is actually a floating dock right here. That's this dock that we're driving past. We're getting all the pieces of it. And I will talk about that in a second because these shadows tell you a story. Floating docks can be, um, they can be confusing to interpret, but I'm gonna try and explain this the best that I can. So let's look at this floating dock real quick. This is a phenomenal example of side imaging and shadows. So we'll start with, got some fish around here. These are crappie suspended on here. And then this is the actual dock. Now, you're thinking, okay, this is like the float you're seeing above the water. Not necessarily. What you're actually seeing are the cross members underneath the dock. And this here is going to help illustrate that. So here at Lake the Ozarks, this is kind of what your typical dock looks like. This is not the actual dock that we scan past. It's a few down, but it's the same setup. So you're gonna have like a boat slip and a boat slip, right? In between those boat slips, you have a bar that comes down, goes over, goes back up. And then beneath that, like the next slip, you have the same thing. And then you have a bar that ties everything together. So you can see here is the bar that's underneath the boat slip. And then here are the bars that actually go down cross members like that and they actually tie together they have cross bracing in there and that is basically what gives these stocks some structural support keeps them from twisting and stuff like that so that's what you're seeing and and this here is actually just the shadow of all that you can kind of see them the actual bars slightly here that go beneath them but a lot of times you're not going to get that great of a picture on that a lot of times your best bet's going to be looking for the actual shadows themselves so here's what crappie look like on your side imaging these fish are suspended just out in open water. I was in about 30 feet of water, but you can tell that they are suspended high in the water column by the shadows here. So here are the actual fish. I'll zoom in just a little bit so you can see. So here's some schools of fish. You got a group here, group here, group here. Well, you can see the shadows of them are all the way over here. So since there's a lot of distance between the shadows and these up here, lets you know that these fish are suspended pretty high in the water column. If you've had all your bright returns like this, and they were over here or say just in this instance it's right here and the shadows started right beneath them like right here that would indicate that those fish are much closer to the bottom we're coming up on another brush pile here and i'm going to get this brush pile on the way out i'm going to get it set up so it's it's out here more so you know exactly what you're looking at and not just right underneath your boat that is what brush can look like when it's not directly kind of beneath your boat on your side imaging. So basically what you're gonna get is these shadows right here. You may see a little bit of a brighter return in some spots, but a lot of times like with this particular palette, it gets too washed out and it's hard to distinguish anything. So what you're looking for is just a shadow like this. And over here is a cool little find actually. This is actually an old sunken boat. You can see it pretty well. You can see the bow area here. You can see the inside and you see a shadow from it and looks like maybe it used to be the old motor. A decent size though, but that is what that looks like. I don't think I've ever actually noticed that before and there's more dock parts stuff. There's so much stuff here at like the Ozarks on the bottom. It's, it's almost sad. Uh, and then here is shad. This is a big ball of shad and you can, this is a good example of the shadow behind them. So this is letting you know that these fish here are very close to the bottom. You can see that the, the bottom of the school ends here and the shadow starts here. So it's basically connected. So that's letting you know that they're close to the bottom. Something else to keep in mind of this little picture just shows a good example of it is the bottom composition itself. So you have a hard bottom, you have hard bottom, and you have the softer bottom. So what this actually is, is you're coming out of this little ditch kind of creek. I guess I'd call it a small creek, basically, feeding into the gut of this cove. Just from the way I drove the boat in at the angle, I came across it like this and that's kind of how this portrayed. So these shad are sitting right in the gut of that little creek channel. Well, here's a good example of the creek channel coming in, circles, there's some crappie there, it comes down, some shad there. Just runs right in the gut of this, but you can see it's obviously not, uh, it's not straight. And it's even got a little hard patch in the middle there. That'd be something good to target with an A-rig or something. It looks like there's something in there, but I'd have to get a little closer to 
verify that. So we're idling along here. I'm getting pretty close to the bank just to kind of give you a better visual, better understanding of what you're saying. So here is the bank itself. You can see we've kind of got some busted up, I would say almost like baseball to softball size rock in there. And you can kind of see what they look like over here. You can see the difference in the rock. See that it is it is kind of busted up and there's smaller pieces kind of get a gauge for what that looks like under there. But you can also see how this is a total dead zone here where it's just black. That's actually the bank. Sonar is no longer shooting past that. So that's going up here on this little clock thing. And this is kind of what it looks like on your sonar, on your side imaging. So things are gonna be a little distorted, a little bit stretched out here because I'm turning, but this is essentially the point. And then it's, it's running out here and this is actually kind of the drop off on the bluff and you see you have a lot of crappie here you have some other fish spin out here i'm sure some of these fish in here are actually bass there's a large concrete block or rock or something out there um so that's kind of what what that looks like on your side image okay this will be the last screenshot of the video here and these are condo docks so if you like to crappie fish this is something that you should familiarize yourself with Site imaging is a great tool to just cover a lot of water and scan these large expansive condo docks. If you've ever been to Lake the Ozarks or you're at a, a lake that's very popular and has a lot of docks, you know it can take a lot of time to poke through some of the docks sometimes to find the productive areas and this really can cut down on the time that that takes. Now these docks out here are in about 40 feet of water and as you get a little bit closer they shallow up into the about 30 foot range. So these lines that you kind of see coming through here, these are the crossbars. So each one of these bars right here are actually boat slips. And then all these dots around here, these are all crappies suspended through here. So this is actually one side of the dock, and then this is the other end of the dock. So you have basically boats that are parked this way, and then you have a walkway down the middle, and you have boats that are on this side as well. Then you're going to see these long cables right here, these big arches. You're going to see them all over the place. These are actually the anchor cables that are connected to these docks to keep them from moving. So basically you have a connection point around this area or around the outside edge kind of, and they come down and they go to these big concrete blocks we call them dead man's around here but you actually see this one particular cable comes here goes all the way up catches basically onto the dock and comes back down to another dead man here so you're going to have these cables all over the place a lot of times where these cables cross like in this instance right here is a good place to find crappie it just gives them some sort of vertical structure to suspend around but you can also catch bass and stuff off these vertical cables it doesn't really take much and a fish will suspend on it especially over open water but i thought the screenshot was just a good example of what you're seeing and i actually drove in between the middle of two docks so this is actually another dock over here so this is basically in between and then this is the entire dock itself but you can see it's just totally loaded with crappie and that's how a lot of these condo docks are basically year round all right i hope this video helped you with side imaging it's a lot to take in there's a lot of interpreting you kind of have to figure it out it's not the most intuitive thing uh, to just turn on your graph and know exactly what you're looking at with side imaging but with a little bit of practice watching this trying to look at some of the examples uh, you can really familiarize yourself with how your unit's working and get those settings to the body of water that you're on and really just help you understand the areas of your lake. You can cover so much ground with it. You can eliminate dead water with it. And that's kind of the name of the game, especially on a larger reservoir, to try and make the most of your time on the water. So if you're new to site imaging, one of the first things I would recommend doing is going out on the water and going past something that is familiar that you can maybe see on the bank, something that is Always a good option if your boat ramp allows it, just depends how it's set up, is if you can idle you know, perpendicular to your boat ramp and you can kind of see how that looks on side imaging and that kind of gets you started a little bit. And then maybe go off to something that you are familiar with, whether that's like a piece of structure, like a rock change or something, or you can go past like brush piles if you have them that you're familiar with that you fished before, something that you just know is there and side scan past that, go past it a few different times, different angles, adjust your settings, and kind of just get familiar with your unit and how things look. And then you can branch out and look at different areas and figure out, you know, kind of what's going on. There's one thing I want to add, and that's just do not get caught up in trying to make your unit have the most perfect picture. They're going to take the best screenshots they can get of things, touch them up, whatever, do whatever they can in marketing to just show you this fantastic picture of you're going to see all of this detail, it's gonna be so perfect. That's not really the real world. A lot of the times, like the big trees and stuff they have are humongous. If you go over a brush pile, that's you know the size of like a, a kitchen table or something like that, it doesn't look like much on side imaging. It's gonna be pretty small and you're just basically gonna see a little bit of shadow on it. So don't get caught up on looking for just huge things. Remember you're scanning a relatively large area. So things are not gonna be big, especially on a smaller screen. Even with a 12 inch unit, 
like that's relatively small screen to fit all this data onto. So go out with your unit, whatever you have, a little bit of trial and error, um, just put some time on the water, put some rods away for a while and just scan around a little bit, see what you get, maybe mark some things and then come back and fish it and see, you know, if you can catch any fish on it or if that helped you or what. You spent all this money on these units, so learn how to use them to the best of your ability and then let them help you put more fish in the boat. So thanks for watching guys. Hopefully this video helped you. If you have any questions or anything, drop a comment, whatever, message us on Instagram, Facebook, and I'll try and help you out.